Um, I'd like to welcome everyone, everyone to our last public ecosystem restoration seminar this semester. We'll be moving to student presentations uh, starting next week. I'm really excited for this presentation to introduce our speakers today. And that includes Dr. Brennan Moynihan from the CESU Research uh, Division, where he's at the Cooperative Ecosystem Services Unit at the Rocky Mountain. Uh, and he serves as the research coordinator and science advisor for the NPS. We also have Wheezy Little Elk, who is the CEO of Rosebud Economic Development Corporation, and Dennis Jorgensen, the Bison Program Manager from the World Wildlife Fund. And I'd like to welcome all three of you here today. Uh, fascinating, it's really fascinating to learn more about um, American bison reintroductions. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Um, this is Brendan. I'll, I'll jump in and get us started here, but um, I want to thank you for the invitation to join this class. Um, I myself have done quite a bit of restoration ecology work and my master's was focused on it. And the more I do this work, um, particularly now in the bison world, um, we are all restoration ecologists <laughs> to some degree. And so I'm really happy to have the opportunity to, to talk to your class. And, and our intent is to leave plenty of time for some discussion on the back end. Um, so yeah, I'll just do a qu quick introduction of myself and then I'll ask uh, Wheezy and Dennis to, to introduce themselves as well. And then we'll come back to the presentation and work through um, uh, a few parts of the presentation to give you an overview of the uh, accomplishment and the ongoing work at the uh, Will Lakota Buffalo Range. Um, so I, I do serve, I'm based in Missoula, Montana. I, um, most of my kind of regular org chart day job is all about putting partnerships together and specifically delivering technical expertise and partnership to national park units. And, and that's principally working with educational institutions. We have quite a few projects actually with University of Wyoming um, working on uh, national park service units across the West, across the country. Um, the other part of my job is to support bison coordination uh, uh, within the National Park Service, and that means working across three different uh, National Park Service regions, the Intermountain region, the Midwest region, and actually the Alaska region. Um, and in my current uh, role in supporting that bison work for the National Park Service, I am the chair of the Department of Interior's bison working group. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So um, I'll stop there, but Wheezy, would you introduce yourself and then Dennis? Sure, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I greet each and every one of you with a good heart. My name is uh, Wizi Palilla. I'm the CEO for uh, Redco Rosewood Economic Development Corporation, which is an ecosystem of organizations uh, working to uh, build prosperity uh, here uh, on the Rosewood Indian Reservation um, and, and surrounding region. And uh, I, 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 I can started to to kind of rethink, uh, you know, who I am and kind of what my title is and everything and and it's become apparent uh that that one of my roles is uh 80th generation buffalo and land steward uh you know my, my ancestors have been at this work for a long time and i'm just the uh, uh a small continuation and, and a long line of people that have been doing this work so uh incredibly honored and, and thankful to to be a part of today's presentation thank you easy uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dennis Jorgensen, and I'm the Bison Program Manager for World Wildlife Fund's Northern Great Plains Program. Um, I've worked for World Wildlife Fund for nearly 14 years, and about six of those have been specifically focused on bison restoration with, with tribes and national parks. Um, but, you know, essentially that entire time I've been working on bison restoration as when I first came on, um, I was immediately working with the American Prairie Reserve in North Central Montana. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to be here and I look forward to sharing uh, a little bit about this project and some of the things that we've learned in our work. Thank you. Great, thanks you both. And just a quick overview on how we're gonna approach this presentation today. I'm gonna um, start off with a little bit of an overview of the intent of the project and situate the project for us uh, geographically and uh, conceptually. 
And then uh, Wheezy Pond will take over with um, uh, perspectives from the Rosebud angle on uh, eff effective partnerships and what we can accomplish by working together. Uh, Dennis will come in and talk about specifically some of the commitments that World Wildlife Fund has made to the Wolokota project and also more generally to, to working through partnership. And then I'll come back around and, and wrap up the presentation by talking a little bit about the, um, the Department of Interior's Bison Conservation Initiative that we wrote and had announced by the Secretary of Interior um, just last year. And, th and that also has a very, very strong thread of um, restoration by way of partnership. Uh, so with that, just a, a quick geographic situation. Um, this project is located in southern South Dakota, um, southwest South Dakota, on the southwest edge or corner of the Rosebud Indian Reservation. And um, to get you fully situated, uh, this is east of where uh, most of you are sitting now uh, on the South Dakota-Nebraska line, but not far from the Wyoming border. And uh, part of what's really interesting about the Willacota Buffalo Range, and I know Dennis will touch on this also, is that um, it's it's a piece that has a really interesting matrix within which it sits. And so um, it's a remarkable um, commitment in its own right for what it is to and within the Rosebud Indian Reservation. But if we zoom out and think about the landscape perspective, which I know um, your restoration ecology class certainly will um, already have discussed quite a bit. There's a much larger framework or matrix of um, of uh, federal, tribal, state, and uh, NGO lands that uh, that all have some orientation to one degree or another to uh, long-term conservation. Um, not necessarily all about bison, but um, as evidence, there's quite a bit of land ownership across uh, five reservations in South Dakota. Um, the national forests and nas national grasslands um, contribute quite a bit of that of that overall conservation framework. Um, in South Dakota itself, Badlands National Park and Wind Cave National Park are both um, uh, some of the anchors of the bison conservation portfolio, if you will, that the National Park Service manages. Um, and I, I know Weezy will come back and talk a little bit about the linkage um, you know, since time immemorial of the Lakota uh, Sioux people to uh, shared origin story with bison at, um, at Wind Cave itself. Um, so it just gives you a little bit of perspective about where we're sitting and how this, how the tribal lands themselves fit within a broader uh, conservation landscape or conservation context. I wanna jump right now and just share with you um, uh, the moment that bison were returned on October 30th of last year to uh, the Wolokota Reservation. And this is a landscape that is in the heart of the historic range of Plains Bison. And um, Dennis, Wheezy, and, and I were all at this event. And um, it's one of those moments that will absolutely stick with us for a lifetime, I'm sure. So it's it's hard to communicate exactly what you know how impactful a moment that was, but I'm sure you all can have a, a sense of it. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the the historical backdrop that led to that moment. That you know, Weezy already talked about all of us functioning and operating as kind of the next the present generation of of stewards um, of of lands, ecology, culture. Um, in this part of the world, and um, we this this moment arrived um, only because of the really complex, um, sometimes very very dark, and um, and recently quite positive uh, history of 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 the interaction of peoples and landscapes in the American West. So if you look on the left, <clears throat> this is a general representation of the historic range. Of American bison, with with wood bison to the north, but that dark brown is the core historic range of plains bison. Uh, 
spanning Canada to Mexico and nearly coast to coast across the United States. 30 to 60 million bison is the estimate of, of what that uh, that that herd looked like at uh, up until the middle of the 1800s. And within a period of really about 20 to 30 years of uh, in, in intense uh, exploitation and intentional manipulation and uh, decimation of buffalo herds, we went from about 50 million to r roughly 100 in the wild over the course of you know mostly 20 years, which is remarkable, the work and intent and commitment it took to do that. Um, if you look on the right hand side, it just gives you a, a kind of a static view of, of really a fluid process of the contraction of the range of bison across that same area. So each of those um, numbers is the date um, at which bison were last documented in that particular area. And if you start to look, you can see earlier dates farther out toward the end, end of the range. 1795 bison documented in, in Pennsylvania. Um, moving all the way forward to the the, uh, the greatest constriction in the late 1800s, uh, 1880s, uh, when when essentially what was left of wild bison herds was, um, you know, on the order of uh, several dozen in in yellow in what is now Yellowstone National Park. So it's it, it's hard to overstate the um, the scale and the and the and the, the impact from a restoration ecology, from an ecological perspective of removing 50 million uh, large herbivores from a continent. Uh, you've probably seen some versions of these photos, but even after the bison were gone, uh, uh, settlers and, and, and uh, prospectors, I guess you could call them, went out and gathered skulls and bones from across the prairie Bringing them, bringing them back to produce fertilizers in bone china and that sort of th sort of thing. So this just gives you one snapshot of one angle of one location of uh, what surely is tens of thousands of, of buffalo skulls having been gathered up. Now, that story of the of the eradication of buffalo in the United States um, goes hand in glove with the control the genocide and the um, the directed constraint of Native Americans to reservations. And this this uh, little clip that's playing, you'll see uh, really echoes to, to a large degree that map we saw previously that showed or visualized the range contraction of Buffalo. This is no mistake. This is quite intentional. Um, there are plenty of records that we know of uh, both settlers and uh, market hunters, but also the U.S. military uh, manipulating and exploiting buffalo in order to, um, you know, very intentionally impact and um, uh, gain, you know, exercise control over uh, indigenous peoples. So that can't be lost on us that these two things did not happen in isolation, and they're quite quite directly connected to each other. You know, the interesting thing to me is that uh, the, the last two dates on both that bison uh, range contraction map and the movement of indigenous peoples onto reservations, right about the 1880s, uh, 1890s or so, within 20 years of that action, the US government, the American people were celebrating both those two icons of, you know, the, the image, the, the iconic status, the idea of both Native Americans and Buffalo um, on currency, which is typically reserved for our, um, you know, most prominent figures and, uh, and icons in this country. And so there's a disconnect, or this is a really good example, I think, of a tendency to um, in 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 uh, in American history and certainly human history, I think, to uh, try to exercise control over other people and systems, and then remember them uh, quite differently than um, than we treated them even just a few decades before. So. Um, 
I, I just think that that's a really impactful thing to recognize that within 20 years, we were, um, we had the images of Native Americans in Buffalo on currency. <clears throat> Fast forwarding about uh, 100 years from that date on that particular coin, uh, a number of NGOs uh, and organizations, tribes, uh, tribal nations, tribal organizations, and, um, and the American public uh, successfully completed a campaign to have Congress recognize bison as the national mammal. And, um, and that is meaningful because it set the stage for a lot of this restoration work that we're going to be talking about more specifically today. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, ask Wheezy to, um, to take the helm here and talk a bit about um, the, the, uh, his peoples and the, and the Rosebud's perspective on both this history, but also the project itself. You're uh, muted, Wheezy. Oops, there we go. Thanks, Brendan. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the historical uh, and, and cultural meaning of Buffalo uh, to us, our vision, and then talk about the project and how uh, some of the lessons learned from a partnership perspective and in, in terms of what uh, this project teaches us. Uh, in the in the from a Lakota spiritual, uh, cosmological, ontological perspective, uh, we believe that uh, there was a period in history in which we existed on Earth, uh, and that we were probably not necessarily in human form. Uh, and that uh, the beings on earth were given very specific instructions on how to live and how to act and how to behave uh, with one another and the natural world. A great number of those uh, that existed in those different kinds of beings, maybe they were different kinds of species, uh, did not listen to those instructions from the creator. And so there was what we call the great cleansing. Um, and there was water and there was fire uh, and the earth opened up. And uh, we call those beings the children of disobedience. And they were wiped from the face of the planet. Some of the, the beings that existed at that time were following the instructions. Essentially, they were, they were good. They were, they were good, good folks. And so the earth opened up and we went into the earth and uh, stayed there for a long time. And our word for ourselves during that period of history is called Pte or Pte Oyate. And then uh, at a later time in, in history, uh, we were tricked um, into coming up to the surface. And, uh, you know, there's several different versions, but, but essentially what happened is that some of us came up and we became an emerged uh, and human form. And some of us came up as Buffalo in Buffalo form. And so for us, there is really no difference between a human being and a Buffalo. And there is a very specific and defined relationship and roles that Buffalo have and that we have. And, and essentially we, we consider Buffalo to be our ancestors, uh, to be kind of a higher version than, than what we are, uh, and that they are our teachers uh, and that they are also our providers. Uh, there was also a time in history when Buffalo uh, were said to, to eat humans um, and uh, God intervened and, and kind of an order was established where the boat, where we would eat buffalo. And so uh, when you approach and look at buffalo or tatanka is, is, is our word for, for them, as a relative, as opposed to uh, an animal or a commodity, uh, the relationship becomes much different and more defined and more important. It takes on greater meaning. And, and so 
you know, one of the things that we will always say is that when the Buffalo are strong, uh, we'll be strong. And that the genocide that was committed uh, against, you know, indigenous people and, you know, from our perspective, from Lakota, against Lakota people, uh, an equal genocide, if not greater, was committed against Buffalo. And that, you know, just as you would see the dwindling of uh, Buffalo numbers and uh, land, if we were to also put up a map, you know, kind of showing just the, the, the number of indigenous people in North America, you would also see that there's a kind of a direct correlation uh, between those numbers as well. And so, you know, the story of the rebirth and reintroduction of Buffalo to the Great Plains is also the story of indigenous rebirth uh, and, you know, kind of reclaiming our ability to, to live and be on earth. You know, we, we say that this, you know, I guess the Buffalo, there was an event, uh, 1804, August 3rd, I believe, is when Lewis and Clark recorded the first uh, killing of a Buffalo. And that was about 200 miles from where, well, less than 200 miles from where I'm sitting in over by Yankton, uh, South Dakota, along the Missouri River. And, uh, you know, there's been a kind of this constant onslaught since. Fast forward, uh, you know, to the 1980s, and there emerged a movement to begin reintroducing buffalo back onto native lands. And so uh, a number of herds were established across the United States and in different Indian reservations. And Rosebud, you know, was able to establish a small herd. Uh, and many of those herds are, are kind of what called uh, cultural herds. And uh, you know, we, we have those herds. Um, they exist simply because it's the right thing to do. Uh, however, in order for us to be who we are as Lakota people because of our unique um, connection to Buffalo, combined with the great need for uh, the rewilding of certain places, the increase in the number of acres that are devoted to uh, regenerative agricultural practices, the need to increase uh, biodiversity, plant diversity, animal diversity, uh, and the need for greater economic uh, benefit in regions like Rosebud and in others, and you know, particularly across the Great Plains, um, the reintroduction of buffalo becomes incredibly important. And so uh, the Wolakota project is a 28,000 acre regenerative buffalo range that when fully stocked will be home to uh, 1500 animals. We'll be able to harvest uh, somewhere on the order of 400 or so animals a year. Uh, our approach is, uh, from a cultural perspective in which we uh, explicitly state that we will treat buffalo as buffalo, we will not treat them as cattle, uh, and that we will do all of this in a way that uh, socially impacts and is, is beneficial to our community, is financially sustainable, and that explicitly uh, you know, incre increases and improves uh, the, the environmental health of the land that we're managing. Uh, this herd uh, from a very kind of personal level um, is, represents, uh, you know, only one part of a much larger effort uh, that I've, you know, in part committed my life to. And I'd like to see 100,000 acres in Buffalo production here on my reservation. And I'd like also like to, to see a million acres uh, devoted to of new buffalo pasture, um, certainly within my lifetime. Uh, kind of the basics, um, you know, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe uh, owns just under a million acres of land. A vast majority of that land is managed 
by another corporation called uh, Tribal Land Enterprise. And so we lease, we have a 15 year lease on that land. And uh, TLE has provided that land to us at a reduced rate. Um, a lot of people at this point say, well, why are you leasing land from your own tribe? Uh, well, Tribal Land Enterprise is actually a corporation that was established in order to one, manage land, and then two, buy back stolen land. And so in order for us to sustain ourselves and in order for us to continue moving forward with projects like this and others, we're actually having to buy back stolen property. And so, you know, it necessitates that we actually lease this land from ourselves because um, at the end of the day, we're all owned by the tribe. It's also important that we build up the project in a way that over the course of the long term, it will be financially sustainable, which is why, uh, you know, we planned on, plan on harvesting, you know, between four and 450 animals a year. Um, all of this will create a, a self-sustaining cycle where this, you know, after, in year six of our startup, this herd will be fully sustainable uh from a environmental perspective from, from a kind of a investment perspective from a financial perspective um and will serve as as a model for future development uh, we're just entering year two uh we have 134 animals that are on the ground uh right now um and really has only come about through uh partnerships which is incredibly important for on a number of reasons. I think from a Lakota perspective, uh, there's kind of two things that really govern who we are. Uh, one is, is this idea of wotakuye, which means relatedness, interrelatedness. We believe that everyone is related. We believe that all things are related and that that governs the, the way in which we move and carry ourselves throughout the world. And our, our life success is dependent on maintaining and growing uh, healthy relationships. And then two, uh, you know, again, you know, this idea of relatedness is that, uh, you know, this idea of mitakuye oyasing, saying we are all related. And that's really the way that we, we approach our work, that success can't ever be achieved in a vacuum and that it takes multiple people multiple organizations moving together in, in one direction. And of course, you know, what does that mean? And, and who are we mimicking? A single buffalo on the plains is not gonna last very long. And if it does, it's not gonna have a very good life. However, when you get a herd of buffalo moving in, in, in unison, there's nothing that's, that's gonna stop them. They will, run through a concrete wall, they will move cars, they will move tractors, they're, they're an unstoppable force. And so we can move and act in the same way. And so from our partnerships, you know, we're incredibly thankful to World Wildlife, uh, who's, you know, served as a, what we call a catalyst organization, organization that provides um, things that we can't acquire on our own. Well, which is access to fundraising and to kind of technical assistance. And, and so they've been a great partner uh, helping to, to assist us and guide us along the way. We've also been, been very fortunate to receive, you know, kind of technical assistance from two of the, the best in the industry, uh, Wild Idea Buffalo, which is a leader in uh, sustainable uh, raising of buffalo on a very similar scale to ours as well as ted turner ranch enterprises which is of course the largest uh buffalo ranch operation in the world uh you know so literally being able to say we're tapping the expertise of you know two of the best businesses and then uh the u.s department of interior you know and brendan's role in this can be overstated stepped up and said you know what uh, we are going to include your project as part of the Department of Interior's 10-year national bison management strategy. First time in history that, that, has, has, that a non-federal entity has ever been included. And so what that means is that allows us to access Buffalo directly uh, from the, the Department of Interior through the National Park Service and through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so, you know, and then other NGOs have stepped up as well. 
uh, the American Prairie Reserve has also committed to provide buffalo. Um, and, then, uh, and then the funding, because at the end of the day, this is still a business and uh, run and operated as a business. Uh, we have received a number of social impact investments uh, from family foundations uh, using a blended capital approach, uh, which is also very unique and, and unique generally, but also unique in Indian country in terms of, you know, kind of being first of, gener of its kind projects. So we have the business sector, tribes, tribal corporations, the federal government, uh, and NGOs all coming together to do something that has never been been done before at this scale. And in order to, to create um, what will become the world's largest uh, Native American owned and managed buffalo herd. Uh, so that's kind of a broad overview and how we approach our work. Dennis. On mute, Dennis. Thanks so much, Wheezy. Um, and thanks again for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I'll just start by providing an overview of the landscape within which uh, World Wildlife Fund's Northern Great Plains program works. Um, so essentially we work within the Northern Great Plains ecoregion, which spans 183 million acres of short and mixed grass prairie and that region includes 15 Native nations who manage some of the largest intact uh, grasslands in the region. Um, I don't think it can be overstated how important it is to work with communities within, within our work to achieve lasting and durable conservation. Uh, World Wildlife Fund works, of course, with, with tribes um, within that region on a number of fronts. Um, of course, there's the bison work that we do. Um, one of my colleagues also works on black-footed ferret restoration. Uh, another works at Pine Ridge on a communal lands project associated with the um, south unit of Badlands National Park, which occurs uh, entirely within the Pine Ridge Reservation. And then um, another colleague, Libby Kumalo, uh, um, works with uh, a number of tribes in the region um, through the Buffalo Nations Grasslands Alliance to uh, work on securing um, stable uh, and sufficient funding for tribal wildlife programs in the region. Um, you know, I think Wolakota is essentially the embodiment of, of the work that we do with tribes to work with communities to bring resources and the technical expertise that we can to uh, projects. Next slide. Thank you. Um, with respect to our work for uh, uh, on the bison program and, and the goals associated with that, um, our first goal is to support uh, tribal partners to address their needs in establishing sustainable bison programs. And as Wheezy Pan suggested, you know, to us it's really important uh, that those programs are ecologically, culturally, or socially and economically sustainable. Uh, you know, the work that we all do, we want to see it last, we want to see it be meaningful, we want to see it be beneficial. And uh, if it accomplishes all of those things, uh, then I believe that, you know, the outcome will be that we will see bison on this landscape for, you know, in perpetuity. Um, another goal of our program, uh, which I would say to me is secondary, is um, establishing five herds of at least a thousand bison each in the Northern Great Plains by 2025 with national parks and with Native nations. And the reason that we've selected a thousand bison is based on uh, genetic um, diversity and ensuring the long-term um, genetic health of bison populations. Um, after the bottleneck that, that Brendan described when bison populations were reduced um, to hundreds of animals, uh, during the restoration, essentially there was about nine, uh, 20,000 bison res restored by 1935, um, but 75% of the herds numbered fewer than 400 animals since that time. And so there are concerns about the long-term uh, genetic health and diversity of, of bison. So that's why we've set that goal of um, 
establishing herds of a thousand bison each. Um, here you can just see in 2019, um, the partner uh, organizations and herds that we are working with. We need to update that to 2020. Uh, as as um, Wizipan mentioned, there are now 134 bison at Wolakota, which is wonderful and thrilling and so awesome to um, have uh, a new site uh, that is achieving great things in the, the near term and in the long term. Uh, next slide. Now, I, I feel very fortunate to work for World Wildlife Fund. Um, our organization is over 60 years old. And um, one thing I would say is that, you know, in the time that I've worked at World Wildlife Fund, I've come to realize how important it is to work with communities uh, to achieve conservation goals. And from my perspective, I think that um, that means taking a very holistic approach where you identify uh, the vision, the, the needs, uh, the values, the aspirations of the communities with which you work. Um, and again, from my perspective, I don't think that traditional conservation or, you know, you might say old school conservation necessarily, necessarily looks like that. I think that often there has been a top down approach to conservation. Um, and, you know, I'm really proud and, and excited about this project because I do think that it, um, it involves a great deal of humility and recognition of um, historic wrongs, um, uh, atrocities, and, and really looks at how can we start in the right place um, on projects like this. And so, as I said, you know, World Wildlife Fund really tries to begin by understanding the values, needs, and aspirations of, of our tribal partners. Um, in this case, Redco, um, of course, has vast experience and, and Wizi Pan himself is a, is a member of the uh, Sichangu uh, Oyate. And, and um, so I think that Redco and the constituency that they already have brings that perspective of what the community needs, wants, what their values and, and aspirations are. Um, but in in this context more broadly, often what World Wildlife Fund has done is, is when we initiate the work, we, we do try and conduct, conduct broad surveys of the community. Um, you can see an example here, this is from Fort Peck Reservation, um, where we, we essentially engaged a, a community stakeholder group that we work with uh, on, on Buffalo issues. Uh, and we had them work with us to develop a survey and again, I wouldn't call it a traditional survey. You know, there it was it was extremely broad in terms of asking the questions that we felt community members and leaders and managers would want answered. How often do you commun uh, consume buffalo meat? How often would you like to consume buffalo meat? Do you support hunting of buffalo? Um, you know, engaging youth in in uh, learning about buffalo. Um, a number of different fronts, uh, just to really understand what what the people want and need, um, and you know that's been super valuable. And and I guess I would say overall, you know, once we understand those things, we then work to bring resources to our partners in those communities to do what they want to do, what they feel is important. And you know, I, again, I feel very fortunate to work for an organization that can bring expertise, um, you know, including GIS, um, an established global platform. We work around the world, you know, we, we communicate uh, nationally and, and, and around the world. So this story, we've been able to reach a national and international audience and to help uh, uh, elevate the story of, of what's happening here. And I, you know, I think it's, it's been, just remarkable and thrilling to see the response. And I, I think we really are in a pivotal time where the coming together of tribes, NGOs, the federal government, corporations, foundations, there is the potential for dramatic change on this front. You know, my, my hope as, as Wheezy Pan said, I, I would love in my lifetime to see bison re restored to a million acres uh, with the traditional stewards of those lands uh, um, managing and guiding that restoration. Um, I, I, I also ascribe to the perspective that Wheezy Pond shared that when the Buffalo are strong, the people will be strong. 
um, you know, I've, I've seen that um, in this time of COVID, um, I've seen some of our tribal partners drawing on the surplus from their buffalo herds to ensure that those in need have food, um, that elders and others have been safe and have been able to shelter in place. Um, the, the buffalo can be a, a buffer, they can mitigate, they can bring prosperity. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just very, very humbled and proud to, to be part of this particular project. And, and I think it can be a model for, for what is possible. Um, just a couple of quick facts and figures. So um, approximately 46% of tribal agricultural lands are leased to non-tribal operators. And as Wheezy Pun said, you know, the, the, whether it's the Bureau of Indian Affairs or a, a tribal land enterprise that leases those lands to non-tribal operators, they are doing it to try and secure the greatest amount of return to those tribes. But, you know, my hope is that work like this will demonstrate that those lands could be in tribal hands and could generate um, ecological benefit, social benefit, uh, and economic uh, opportunity uh, contributing to food sovereignty as well. Um, and, you know, recognizing that within this same Northern Great Plains region, there is 40% food insecurity amongst tribes. To me, you know, it seems that there is significant opportunity to help put tribal lands back in tribal hands while restoring a native species. That's all I have, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Um, I want to shift a little bit now and talk about some of the federal perspective on being engaged and supportive of, of projects and initiatives like this. And, um, and I say that very intentionally because it's, it's quite important um, given the reality of, of the origins of the project itself, but also that historic context that we talked about earlier on that um, these initiatives are not federal initiatives. They shouldn't be branded that way. Um, they shouldn't be um, uh, publicized that way. There is a very um, important and, and valuable functional role for the federal government to play in these big issues of, um, of ecological, cultural restoration, economic opportunity development, all these, all these big issues. Um, but it need not come with a whole lot of fanfare. I think it comes uh, best when there is broad uh, and organic ownership of these projects as there is with the Willacota project. So a little bit about the Bison Conservation Initiative. Um, we, the, the, the Department of Interior um, has a, a, essentially a communication and coordination body on bison issues called the Bison Working Group. <clears throat> that group was founded in 2008, chartered in 2008, um, initially under a Republican administration, under the waning days of the Bush administration. Um, and it brings together the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which manages the National Wildlife Refuge System and, uh, and a number of refuges uh, support bison herds. The National Park Service, of course, the Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the USGS as, as kind of a science support arm. Um, the, the group was initially focused and, and tasked with um, uh, principally addressing some of the conservation biology, the conservation genetics concerns with conserving bison as a species. And, um, and we've done a really good job with that. We've done a really great job with the science products, uh, conducting uh, scientific analyses, uh, pursuing the next generation of genetic sampling techniques, understanding and supporting development of investigations into cattle integration to uh, address that legacy issue of the bison story. And, um, and to also really investigate the, the conservation concerns that, uh, that if we're not acting intelligently, that we can bring upon ourselves and upon, upon bison by, uh, by managing herds in isolation in relatively small numbers over long periods of time. We know that that's an ineffective way to do it. So the, with, with 2020, with the 2020 initiative, uh, there was a really pivotal moment where we had captured the attention of another Secretary of the Interior, um, 
And, and I will note that uh, uh, this was Secretary Bernhardt under the Trump administration. Um, and I highlight that only briefly to indicate that um, the bison conservation story is one that is, uh, enjoys quite broad bipartisan support. This is not an issue that we see much division with. And, um, and I think that that sets the stage for um, some great movement forward once we recognize that and think about how to approach this issue strategically. But given that we had spent about 12 years on the conservation genetics uh, tasks and accomplishments, we had the opportunity with the attention of the secretary uh, about a year and a half ago to pitch the next step. And the next step is to uh, orient the bison working group, the Department of Interior, and this is specifically talking now about the, the herds that the federal government manages. Um, to, to orient that work toward continuing the kind of the, the cold hard science process of conservation genetics and conservation biology, uh, bison health management, disease surveillance, those sorts of things, but to look much more broadly. So we, we retain the goals of establishing and maintaining wild healthy bison herds we maintain and carry forward the goal of uh, doing our best work to ensure genetic conservation of the species over the long term. And then we take a much more broader approach that we haven't, haven't engaged on before. And uh, there are three new goals to this 2020 Bison Conservation Initiative that set the stage for uh, more engagement with partners like, uh, like Rosebud with World Wildlife Fund and with others to, um, to collectively realize uh, greater bison conservation. So we explicitly recognize that this work um, toward the interests of the Department of Interior in conserving bison uh, virtually entirely, entirely relies on shared stewardship. We'll talk a little bit about that, but um, the, op the greatest opportunities right now for establishing new large wild healthy bison herds rest principally with three categories of partners. Uh, tribes would be first and foremost among them. Also states, um, to the extent that states would be interested in establishing wild uh, state managed bison herds that could be hunted by the American public. And also uh, supporting the work of NGOs like World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Nature Conservancy, and even smaller organizations that wanna support bison conservation. And then especially relevant to this class, this restoration ecology class, um, we've made the first ever linkage within the Department of Interior to um, expressly acknowledge that with bison, it, uh, it, this issue is far, far more than just conservation of a species. Um, and Dennis and, and Wiesipan have laid the groundwork beautifully for us to understand that you cannot separate and isolate uh, the ecological influence of bison and the cultural influence and identity of bison um, from each other and still succeed in overall conservation. Those two things are inseparable and not just for the Lakota people and the origin story that, uh, that Wizipan shared with us, but, um, but the, the bison are these strong interactors on the landscape. Uh, bison and people have interacted for millennia um, have shaped the landscape together and carried each other through um, uh, many, many generations. And uh, the, the cultural connections of bison, not only to tribes, but to the full American public with bison as a national mammal, uh, it, 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 both, it, it can't be overstated, but it also should not be thought of as something in the past. These, these relationships, these identities, stories, songs, prayers, the, the feeling that someone has when they go to Yellowstone for the first time and see that herd crossing the road in front of them. Um, these things are deep and they're alive and they're active today here. Um, that being said, there's huge, huge opportunity for expanding that. And as Dennis's uh, um, survey showed for expanding access to bison, both for ecological and for cultural purposes. So some specific actions for the new bison conservation initiative that we're undertaking right now with the bison working group. The first is we're, um, we're continuing kind of that 
that cold technical part of managing uh, the federal herds um, to the best of our abilities and, and doing our best work internally. That means managing herds with some degree of movement, occasional movement of small numbers of animals among herds so that there is that genetic connection. And we manage the herds as a meta population, which is a, uh, it's, it's just a, um, a single word that captures the idea of managing um, many units in a connected way. It's essentially a, a population of populations. Um, so, so there's connectedness among them. We're also standing up now a group internally to, uh, to start looking outward and initiate a shared stewardship plan. So to reach out to tribal state NGO partners, interest groups like hunter organizations, um, producer groups, and understand how the federal government can um, can not only do its best work internally, but also be you know something of a scaffold upon which others can build conservation success. Uh, the third action is to improve and expand on mechanisms that we have in place for that ecocultural restoration of live bison and the delivery of live bison to tribes. And so you know over the last twenty years, the federal government has has sent um, you know, somewhere, I don't know exactly, more than 20,000 live bison to tribes and tribal partners um, from both national parks and national wildlife refuges. Every herd, even the wild Yellowstone herd um, and uh, the Book Cliffs herd, uh, Henry Mountains herd in Utah, all these herds are um, spatially constrained ultimately in some way. They're, just, they're not tolerated going everywhere all the time. So um, most federal herds do occasionally, often yearly, um, reduce num animals on their own holdings, often fenced holdings, and supply animals annually to uh, principally to tribes and tribal partners. And then finally, another action which we were uh, we we put into the bison conservation initiative, which is you know perhaps seems a little bit smaller, but is uh, is very important, is to institutionalize low stress handling, and that helps us really approach bison management as wildlife management, and to help uh, help us move past a legacy of bison being managed um, in kind of a, a glorified livestock operation uh, perspective. So I want to I want to point out just a couple key new directions between that founding of the DOI Bison Working Group in 2008 and where we're going now. Um, we're leading the 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 world really for development of some of these meta population approaches. We've pulled in uh, 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 exceptional wildlife geneticists from the USGS to lead the effort. Um, recently, I've just pulled in the Conservation Biology Institute, which is an institute underneath the Smithsonian Institution, to help support the technical um, analysis and delivery that will help us have optimal recommendations for uh, connectedness among federal herds. Uh, one really key thing that we got into the Bison Conservation Initiative, and, and frankly sailed right through, was a very plain and explicit recognition of bison as native North American wildlife. And this is really important from a from a political and a, and uh, and not just a uh, in a practical, not just a semantic standpoint, because many states view bison in very very different ways. Some states only view bison as livestock. Some view them as wildlife. Some have uh, no designation. Some uh, have two or three concurrent designations. Uh, Montana has three, for example. Um, and then, of course, I, I already highlight, highlighted this, but this uh, this linkage of ecological and cultural restoration uh, is incredibly important, and it really causes us to think of things differently within the federal world. Because um, in the in the organization of agencies like the National Park Service and the BLM and Fish and Wildlife Service, the natural and cultural resource programs are siloed right from the highest levels of of government, and so establishing those linkages. Um, is something we've known is very important to do, but there's not a better way to do it, I don't think, than, than doing it through bison conservation. Um, a, a quick statement about the bison working group and what we view shared stewardship to be. Um, it's essentially connections with states, tribes, and other stakeholders that um, not only is something that 
um, feels like the right thing to do, but is actually essential given the scale and the complexity of the uh, of the ecological and the cultural significance um, of, of bison and where we'd like to see that go. More specifically, underneath Department of Interior, National Park Service is one of those agencies underneath that department. Um, we're looking very, very actively to find those ways to link natural and cultural resources. Um, again, to use parks as scaffolding to look at how we can support the good work of others where their uh, objectives and, and goals uh, fit within ours. And, um, and, and there are a lot of ways uh, to, to see very clear linkages between objectives that we have internally with having the Park Service uh, be relevant to uh, the full diversity of, of the American public to recruit youth visitors and, and youth um, um, uh, young professionals who can, who can graduate through the chain and become the next, uh, next generation of stewards. And also to address and, and, uh, and reach out to underserved communities um, across the country. So it's very clear that, that you know, the vision that uh, Wheezy Pond and Dennis are supporting and working toward with the Wolokota project uh, fit very, very well with the vision of the Department of Interior and, uh, and more specifically, the National Park Service. Um, you know, I, I put up this slide as we move to some question and answer and some discussion because, uh, you know, a lot of what we've talked about today, they're really uh, big uh, concepts, big, big issues, huge challenges built on uh, an incredibly complex human and, and natural history. Um, some of that, uh, you know, frankly, stained by the way uh, Native Americans and Indigenous peoples across the continent, not just the U.S., have been treated by, um, by federal governments. And um, the impacts of the decimation of bison and Indigenous peoples um, is not just a point in time uh, marker in history that we can look to and understand. It, it, it is that, and we should do the, the deep dig to understand it, but the impacts reverberate uh, very, very strongly today in both human and natural communities. And uh, so this is not a conceptual um, undertaking. It has very, very real world impacts. And ultimately, all of this work is personal. And, uh, and I, I think you've gotten a sense from all three of us today that um, when you bring people together to, uh, to orient ourselves toward writing historical wrongs toward repairing relationships among uh, each other and the natural world. All of it is inherently personal and very, very uh, local. And establish, establishing these relationships like we have today in our team of presenters is, um, it's some of, it, it, not some of, it is the most fulfilling work of my career. And I feel absolutely honored to have been invited to uh, to be part of this project. So um, with that, Christina, maybe you can moderate some questions and answers and discussion, and we'd be happy to talk to you for as long as you'd like. Certainly, thanks very much, everybody. It's a fantastic project and it's wonderful to hear about it. I'd like to suggest uh, that we try moderating questions maybe one of two ways. Uh, if there's not a whole lot of activity, then you're welcome to unmute and to ask a question. I'm also seeing some questions appear in chat and I'd be happy to uh, pass those on to our speakers. So I'll start with one question I've got right now. And how would you characterize the mixed reactions of neighboring private landowners to projects like the American Prairie Preserve? Because I know that's another project that's hit the news lately. Dennis, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure, I, I, I'll begin, thank you. Um, so I, I guess I would say having, having personal experience and having lived in that community, um, that, that as, as Brendan actually said, you know, this is cultural, not just from a tribal perspective, but from a local rural perspective as well. And I think it's just going to take time and, and essentially, you know, that maybe the cliche of being a good neighbor, um, for, for many years, uh, in order to demonstrate what, um, 
how, how let's say the American Prairie Reserve operates. And of course I can't speak for them, but I, I think, you know, so South Dakota is the state with the most bison production herds. And, and I, I can't say for sure, but maybe also the most bison conservation herds. Um, and so there is a, a culture of, of understanding buffalo operations, if nothing else, or bison operations. And I think that in some parts of Montana, like where the American Prairie Reserve has been established, there hasn't been a lot of um, bison operations or, or bison conservation activities. And so it, it becomes um, a situation where, where it, it feels like us versus them. But I think in the long term, it comes down to building community um, and you know, being, in, being in place for a longer period of time. I'd kind of jump in there a little bit too. You know, it, it, when I was an undergrad uh, at Yale, my my first, literally the first class that I signed up for and, and took was was a class called uh, uh, Population Growth, Infectious Disease, and Climate Change. Uh, all very relevant this year. And uh, my my research paper for that class was around brucellosis and bison. And uh, it was true then and it's true now, right? That you've never had a, a documented case uh, where, where brucellosis has been, been transmitted unless it's been in artificial conditions. Uh, and so you, you have a lot of issues out there, you know, I think it, that on one hand, we, you know, the, we have this, this national mammal and symbol of, of strength and freedom contrasted with you know, kind of this this disdain in, in many areas for that that particular animal, and you know, locally, uh, you know, we have cattle ranchers surrounding our property, and uh, you know, here in the beginning, uh, there's been been two things that I think have have made for good relations. One is reaching out. You know, the first I remember the first day I drove out to the property. Uh, th there was a, a, a ranch hand who turned around and uh, saw us driving out. He chased us down in his gator, pulled us over, asked what we were doing there. And so we started telling him and uh, he kind of nodded his head a little bit. And, uh, and I gave him my cell phone and I said, you know, if you have any questions or problems or something, here's my cell phone. You can call me anytime. And we're going to, we're going to be good neighbors and we're going to, uh, help you. And hopefully you're going to help us. Um, when we first started building the, the first part of our, our, our fence, one of the neighbors came over and he jumped on that fence and he did everything to, to kind of test it. And at the end, he said, well, this is a good fence. And I was like, yeah, you know, we do good work. And, uh, you know, so, so on, on, on the other hand, like communication is important, but also, you know, good fences make for good neighbors. Um, and, but at the end of the day, and, and I can say this and other folks may not be able to, but, you know, I could, this is Buffalo. This is who we are. And, you know, get used to it. Um, because this is what's good for us. This is what's good for our economy. Uh, this is what's good for the planet. And, you know, if you're against jobs and wealth creation and increasing value of property and land, then, I, you know, I don't know how you could be against that. Uh, and and that's, that's kind of what we stand for. Or does anybody like would like to ask a question? There's got to be a few out there. You know, wh while they're bubbling up and um, and people are working on their final phrasing for these questions, um, you know, I will say just as a message to students that are working on this on this work, if you're drawn to restoration ecology, you're drawn to it because um, you have a core interest in uh, science and ecosystems and how uh, how things are connected, but specifically in the context of um, repair and fixing, and um, it's um, it's noble work. It is, and and I I, th I think that to the extent I would offer a, a message to students on the who are listening in, um, 
it would be to um, you know to you know work really hard on developing those technical credentials and the technical chops. But um, and I'm sure you've already heard this, but remember that 90% of the work you're going to do is is about people and relationships. And um, and and most of that means um, having patience, humility, and being willing to listen actively, listen to people. Um, so there must be a question now. <laughs> I I would just kind of build on that a little bit, Brandon. That you know, it's interesting. I saw the comment around elephants. That that's ex very exactly how we view this i mean i literally have said you know in, in many respects like you know elephants are, are the buffalo for for you know the, the african continent and other areas that you know they are a keystone species once they're reintroduced into the environment there's an incredible positive impact on the biodiversity of that area but let's also remember that they're doing work buffalo are doing work like we might all, our job is to provide them a home and make sure that they're they're protected. But they're actually doing the work. They're they're the ones who are, who are tilling up the earth and and they're the ones who are, you know, with the planting the seeds and imprinting them deeply into the earth. They're the ones who are actually doing the work. And so, when when we talk about relationships and partnerships, it's not just between humans. It's about us. And, and our Buffalo relatives to say, hey, like Buffalo, God put you on this earth to do something. We're going to provide you a space. You go do the work that you were created to do. And, and so when we talk about all these ecological benefits and whatnot, it's, it's, uh, it's not us doing it. It's, it's, it, it's, it's kind of hubris to think that we as humans are the ones doing it because we're just we're, we're building a fence. Right. We're not actually doing the work. The Buffalo are actually doing the work. Yeah, and I, I would um, just to riff on that a little bit, Weezy. I would. Uh, I, I think that that point about hubris is really important. I think that there's a certain um, there's a certain mentality. I think in the federal government, where we are the ones that own the projects, um, kind of manage the land, um, can tout this conservation story of buffalo. But if we stop at where we are right now as the end of the conservation story, I think we're missing a whole lot of opportunity. And, um, and if, if we are, and, and this is kind of the excitement of working for the federal government right now, you know, each of us, are, you can tell are enthusiastic about the work that we do. Um, and I, I think one of the exciting things about working for the park service right now is that there is this opportunity to, um, to, um, to, I guess, inject a bit more humility. And by that, I mean to look for ways where our success can be measured by the success of others, right? So if, if the federal government is the only source for wild bison in this country, to me, that's not much of a success. Um, if, we have, if we have multiple conservation herds, large herds, even though they may all, or most of them be constrained in space to some de degree, and constrained in population size, therefore. Um, but if we have multiples of them, regardless of ownership or who manages them or who, whose logo is on the entrance sign, um, it's just that many more bison that are available to the conservation community for this ecological and cultural set of objectives that we have. And, um, and I, I'll just add too that it's, there's a transition point occurring in the federal government right now where I think we have enough people um, who think that um, we, we don't have much of a position to, uh, to define for others what their measures of success are, right? So, so if, by that, I mean, if, if we can supply Buffalo to the Wolokota project and, um, and as soon as they leave federal herds, we're, we're, um, we kind of divest our interest in those specific animals then uh, it just it just sets the stage for self determination and uh, and and growth that can hit multiple objectives and that's something that I think is probably the best and highest purpose of the federal government and the national park service. Yeah, 